Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of our double bill today. And if you didn't see the earlier show with J.D. Hewitt from History Underground, it was a two hour sprawl through Guam, Tinian, Saipan, his, his time visiting there, some drone footage he took, and we did the whole background to Operation Forage. So that'd be fa that was fantastic if you didn't go and see that. But today, quite exciting, because the last time this guest was on my channel, I had never met him in person. I, for all he knew, I didn't actually have legs. We have now met up. We've had a beer or two together. We've met up in the green room at the incredible We Have Ways Fest over in, in the UK. So I now... Now, can, now we've got that next level of um, connection with my guest. So, Sol David, well, I mean, he's a he's a sort of superstar of military history, tackling everything from the Zulu Wars to the Dunkirk Operation Thunderbolt, um, World War II, prolifically. And his new book that is he just received his edit, author copies today is Devil Dogs, and we will find out what that's about. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of the the research process, how these days. You, what, someone like Sol takes a project to the the finished stage of a book that he can hold in his hand. So I'll bring him in now. So um, good evening, Sol. How are you today? I'm very well. Very nice to be back, Woody, and good to see you. It was only a couple of weeks ago, actually, wasn't it? It, it was, and uh, I'm still I'm still kind of getting over it. Really, just the amount of people I was meeting, and the, just that nobody was ever off duty. The, the history conversations just carried on. In the minibus, when you're eating, after people's appearances, walking to the appearances, it just was was constant. It's uh, incredible. But um, yeah. So you, as I said there in the top of the show, there, Devil Dogs is your new work, and you've you've touched on this air before because Crucible of Hell, of course, brought you to the to, to Okinawa. I remember talking to you about there about the first thing I want to ask you is this this idea that traditionally. British authors have written about the Burma campaign and American authors have written about the island hopping and not exclusively, but what draws you to, to the American Marines and this island hopping campaign? Is it the visceral nature? Is it the research? What, what, what is it that has drawn you back? Well, the first thing that drew me and, you know, and interesting enough, you, you said at the beginning, Woody, that of course I've got quite a broad range of, of, of subjects. I have written a lot about the Second World War more recently, but of course I go all the way back to the 19th century. And if you take military blunders all the way back to Roman times. So I'm always interested in trying new ground. And, and, and frankly, for British authors and the British audience too, uh, the Pacific War, apart from the Pacific, which a lot of us watched as the, uh, you know, the mini series, is a bit of a mystery. We've seen some films, we've read some books, but we don't know much about it. And so Crucible of Hell was me dipping my toe in the water. And I was alternately amazed and appalled by the, uh, the, the nature of the fighting, the, the, the depths of depravity to which uh, both sides, frankly, were prepared to to go to uh, you know to try and get gain victory on that you know that that terrible campaign the last of course as it turned out of the second world war but w they didn't know it of course the participants then but the then next thing that came into my mind i have to confess is how do we get to this point and it is okinawa uh representative of the rest of the fighting among the islands of the pacific and and so the question was if i was going to tell the whole story of the pacific how was i going to do it it seemed to me completely obvious that if you were getting going to drill down into you know individuals lives you would choose a single unit just of course as as uh, Stephen Ambrose did for Band of Brothers. Um, and amazingly, uh, when I had a quick look at what was out there, uh, there was nothing that had really done something similar. And I was quite surprised, uh, to be truthful, Woody. But that was the, that was the impetus. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I, you know, I got my teeth into it. And it was an amazing project to, to be involved in. And, you know, with, with the research work, I mean, in, in the we'll talk about the particular unit you're writing about, but they come with some pretty heavy hitters who've described the experiences there, which on the one hand gives you this incredible source material and, and you've been able to contact you know, sons of and families of some of these guys there, but also big shoes to follow. I mean, we're obviously alluding to people like, you know, Eugene Sledge and with the old breed. I mean, th these are absolute classics of their genre, aren't they? And obviously what you're doing is not the same thing as, as someone who was in any of these units experience talking about it from their own personal point of view but yet yeah, there, there have been these heavy hitters who talked about the pacific campaign so uh, burden or or bonus there's this, this legacy behind some of these units well I, it's a very good point because it is it is tricky and you are uh, you know you are trading on giants if you if you talk about gene sledge's book i mean it's one of the great memoirs of the second world war with the old breed um 
particularly uh, significant or hard hitting, I think, because he comes from quite a middle class background and yet was was fighting as an ordinary Marine. You know, he was right down there at, you know, at, at, at uh, worm's eye level and but also was very literary himself. Uh, and therefore, he was able to articulate, uh, I think, in a way that's quite unusual for private soldiers or in his case, he was a Lance Corporal or the equivalent private first class. Um, the feelings and experiences of, of ordinary Marines that really hadn't been done before, not, or not, not done in quite, quite the same way. The difficulty, as you say, is how do you top that? And, and of course, it's very easy for people to say, well, if you're going to choose the same unit that Gene Sledge is in, surely we know an awful lot about it. Well, we do know a certain amount about it, of course, from his book, from his perspective, but, but only for, through the last two campaigns. So in telling the whole story of the Pacific War, I wanted to start at the beginning, Guadalcanal, mm. ended Okinawa, and the 1st Marine Division was, of course, the unit that had gone through that whole experience. But no single person, including Gene Sledge, had fought in all four campaigns. In fact, the record uh, is three. So you had some people who were there at the beginning, and they fought at uh, Guadalcanal, New Britain, or Cape Gloucester, as it was also known, the Green Hell of Cape Gloucester, Peleliu, uh, and then some people who'd started at Cape Gloucester and went all the way through to Okinawa, but no one had gone, no one had done the, you know, the grand slam, so to speak. So what I was then going to have to do is knit together both wonderful sources like with the old breed, but also with as many first hand accounts as I could get, as many original letters as I could get of the key players in this single unit K company uh, of the three fifth Marines. And well, thank you for a great answer. And you've got some slides and things that you're going to you're going to show some of them here. So, you know, that process, you know, you've got these great accounts as we just established that. But then you've got to provide this kind of narrative that takes people all the way through, because as you said there, yeah, Sledge had only done part of the campaign there. And, and the other thing is, is you're conveying these these accounts to people is also how to describe the Pacific to someone who's never seen the Pacific. You know, I was talking to JD this afternoon, and the majority of Americans who fought through the ETO, cities like, I don't know, Cologne or Arkan or Paris even, or Cherbourg, they were broadly the same as cities they'd grown up in the USA. Same as from people coming from Coventry or Birmingham or London, cities, rivers, bridges, cathedrals. But the Pacific is such an, an alien environment to anybody, isn't it? So we're in an era now where we have Google Earth. And I know you want, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the people you've, you've brought on board to help you with this project who do know these areas. People like Dave Holland over on Guadalcanal Canal and as Henry yeah. Sledge has traveled around in his, in his father's footsteps. So how important is, is trying to convey the environment uh, with, with a book like this? Well, it's tremendously important because, as you say, it was it was absolutely alien territory to these young men. I, I, and, you know, of course, as was the case in the European Theatre of Operations too, Woody, these are very young men in the main. I mean, we're talking really between 18 and 22, the majority of them of age, which is pretty astonishing when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, I've got three daughters, 16, 21 and 24. So the 24 year old would already be too old for, you know, for going to war. It's just you know, mind boggles, really, that how uh, difficult it must have been for them to adapt. So you do need to get a sense of the terrain. And I was very lucky before lockdown to go out to uh, and research in Okinawa for uh, my original book, Crucible of Hell. Now, while I was working on and researching Devil Dogs, it was pretty much through lockdown or through the whole COVID nightmare. And I wasn't able to go to the other islands, but you, you don't get an exact feeling because they're all very different, but you get a pretty good sense of what the Pacific's like, uh, having seen Okinawa. This coral rock, which is so sharp and so dangerous that an, an, an explosive blowing up in coral rock creates shrapnel from the rock itself, which is just as dangerous as, as the actual metal shrapnel from, from the missile, from the grenade or the, or the shell that's being fired. So it's incredibly dangerous terrain to fight in. It's very difficult to dig uh, dig yourself into, of course, because you're going through the rock too. But um, just to give you a little bit of sense, I'll come back to some of these characters in a minute. Th these are some of the maps, but this is Guadalcanal. I mean, landing on Guadalcanal, you're just faced with a wall, as you can see in this picture, of jungle. As soon as you arrive on the beach, you know, the beach is reasonably uh, easy access. And Guadalcanal, interestingly enough, was one of the few landings in the Pacific where there was no opposition on the beach, mainly because they caught the Japanese defenders by surprise. But 
there again, you know, this this is during the Guadalcanal campaign. The Lunga River was one of the sort of key uh, uh, water water courses that they had to cross back and forth between the uh, the airfield that they were defending. And here's another one that will give you a sense. This is actually three five. That's the unit I'm following, or at least the the battalion I'm following. That's three five on the Matanaca River. Um, and there again, that's them leaving Guadalcanal. As you can see, the terrain is not changing. They are fighting in, in, in fact, you, you, I think I'd go so far as to say without an understanding of the terrain, without getting a sense of what the terrain did to people, forget about the enemy and the enemy were bad enough. You've got no understanding of what it is to fight in the Pacific. So you've got the discomfort of the uh, harsh weather alternating between uh, extremely hot temperatures, but also rainstorms. So you were almost never dry when you were fighting in the Pacific. Um, you're catching all kinds of diseases, uh, particularly malaria, which at one point on Okinawa, for example, uh, was laying up to two to three thousand uh, people, you know, uh, ill. And that's the whole. Uh, that's the whole First Marine Division. Um, it was uh, brutal uh, weather conditions all the way through the Pacific, uh, and so. Probably you, you would say the psychological element uh, on the soldiers fighting there, I should say Marines fighting there. The Marines don't like to be called soldiers, Woody, as I'm sure you know. I keep being yeah, reminded let's, let's of that. The Marines today. Let's, <laughs> no, there's no, enough let's, problems let's, in the world without British historians upsetting <laughs> you as Marine Corps. Let's, let's, <laughs> I, I, I've done it so many times. By the way, I also upset the Marines in the UK Army, so it's not a, it's oh, not a national that double, thing. Double hit there. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's par, par for the course when you're writing about history is... is is offending people with terms and terminology and cover, not cap, and all those things. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I like to get those things right, but I have to say my chief interest, I'll put, lay my cards on the table now, Woody, is, is to get into the human story. And if I get a button wrong or, a, you know, a, l a little bit of the weapon weaponry wrong, um, shoot me now, frankly, because that's going to happen. I'm much more interested in getting the human motivation correct and trying to understand the mindset of the people who go out and do these extraordinary things. Because frankly, although not everyone did the right thing all the way through the Pacific campaign, and I'm but I'm talking on the US side as well. Um, my God, you had to be brave to go out there and survive what they went through. I mean, really extraordinary. A lot of the guys, by the way, just the last point about the, the conditions in Guadalcanal, they came off that four month campaign in December. I'm talking about the guys I was following, the 1st Marine Division in December 1942. And they'd lost a third of their body weight. I mean, they came out like scarecrows. Uh, they were still pretty much wearing the kit they'd gone in with, which was in rags. I mean, when they got to Australia, which was their R&R &R directly after Guadalcanal, I mean, they just looked a mess. And it took them at least a month before they were finally fed up, given new clothes, and they began to look vaguely respectable. One of the mistakes the US military made is that they gave a lot of these Marine veterans um, whatever kit they could find and it was tended to be army kit and and this led to all kinds of trouble with the ninth australian division which of course had made its name in the desert fighting when they got there because not only had the americans stolen a lot of their girlfriends they also mistook them for rear area troops and this led to all awful number of fist fights and you know bad blood they they did eventually work it all out and they and they did part as friends actually when the ninth australian division was sent to new guinea and and of course the first marine division went back into the pacific but it it, it was bad news for a while no definitely and, it, and one of the things you know, you, you're touching on there about the experience of these guys there and that hardship is that and that comes through in books like Sledge's book. But it's if your job is the contextual one of explaining why there's a shortage of medical gear, for example, or why getting water there was difficult. Because the guys at the front are just in the Pacific. You get that sense of just bitching a little bit. I mean, soldiers have the right to grumble. Marines have the right to grumble. That's kind of the, the democracy we're serving in. But with the Pacific, it is explaining that whole idea about how far supplies have had to come. We talked about that on the Okinawa show and things you know, that every drop of drinking water has to have been brought from somewhere else. And so that's some of the things I think the, the visceral accounts we have are brilliant at placing you there, but they don't explain the difficulties of for, for the allies in at a higher level of how difficult it was to wage that Pacific war, because logistics uh, well must come into it. Must, you know, you, without explaining logistics, the Pacific doesn't make any sense. No, and the logistics in the Pacific are off the charts. I mean, they really go haywire uh, when we get to Okinawa, because, of course, that's the furthest point, frankly, uh, before the actual invasion of Japan proper that the Americans get from mainland US, which is still sending a lot of supply. They're still originating from there, of course. Um, 
Guadalcanal's a little bit closer. A lot of stuff's coming up from Australia to get to there. But one of the really scary things about Guadalcanal, it being the first and, you know, arguably one of the great, well, there's no argu arguably about it. It was one of the great turning points of the, of, of the Pacific. The question is, it, was it more important than uh, uh, the Battle of Midway, for example, the Battle of Coral Sea? Probably. I mean, I, I argue in the book that it probably was because what you've got at Midway, which, of course, is the great carrier battle of June 1942, the first time, frankly, the uh, the uh, Japanese have been properly stopped in their tracks, uh, is a, a moment at which the furthest point of advance is reached. But they are still advancing in the southern Pacific. Uh, and one of the reasons why the Battle of Guadalcanal is fought is because the Japanese are still hoping to make advances as far as Australia. And it's creating a chain of redoubts, including on Guadalcanal with its airfield, that the, uh, the Americans are hoping to stop this advance of the Japanese. So, so June 1942, the Battle of Midway has not stopped the Japanese advance entirely, although it stemmed its, its move across the Central Pacific. And of course, we have the fact we've talked about it on this channel before is the fact the Japanese saw the Solomon Islands campaign in conjunction with the Papua New Guinea campaign. So Australians tend to write about Kokoda and Port, you know, um, th th those fighting on Milne Bay and whatever. And Americans write about Guadalcanal, but for the Japanese, that's all big, one big campaign, and it's all being fought at the same time. So that's contextually to get the, the, the fact that the Pacific is is various um, campaigns that we separate putting them back in together as the way the Japanese treated them, which often as that one campaign. But I don't want to talk to you about, about that, the operational level as such. I want to bring back this, this people, because you said something, you know, very pertinent early on about the fact it's the human drama. And you've got some images there with some of the people, because you could, any company you you could write about in World War II, there's going to be characters, but it does seem that when you look at some of these hard nosed Marine outfits, you get these extraordinary characters because you just have to have that. I don't know what you could, stubbornness to survive in that environment let alone be able to kill the enemy so, so who so are some of the people that you, who, who, who uh, you, you write about in the book yeah so we'll just run through a couple of them and you're absolutely right um you need this toughness this 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 doggedness frankly um are they you know are, are they supermen no they are not uh, but i would say the closest unit and it won't uh, be a surprise to hear this the closest unit in the UK Army is, uh, you know, our, our Marines, the Royal Marines. And, and what you've got with the Royal Marines are people who are tough, but really capable kind of problem solvers. You give them a difficult situation. Is it something to do with the sea? You know, I've often asked myself this question, you know, is it that proximity to the sea that has all that uncertainty, you know, and that there are no more difficult operations, I think, you know, we'll all agree than amphibious operations. And they became so vital, both in the European theater of operations and of course in the Pacific. And the people who are really experts in that, in the, uh, from the 1930s onwards in the US armed forces were of course the Marines. They, they had created the first amphibious doctrine. They had trained very hard as a brigade in the in the 1930s and by the time people like uh, Thurman T.I. Miller who's one of my key one of the key characters in the book joined the unit in 1940 they're already pretty adept but they have no idea of the scale of opposition they're going to meet uh, uh, with the Japanese in the Pacific so just to say a couple of words about Miller because he he's He's one of the key players in the story. He was around for two campaigns, and he's very important at the beginning of the story because he's there at Battle Canal and New Britain. So uh, who was this guy, Miller? Well, Miller comes from West Virginia, which, you know, as anyone who knows anything about the U.S. Armed Forces will realize, they have an outsized number of people coming from the Appalachians more generally, and in particular, West Virginia. Uh, these are mountain men, basically. I mean, they come from a really tough environment. Miller was, was one of 16 uh, uh, children born in abject poverty in a place called Otsego in, in West Virginia. Uh, you know, he's brought up in a shack, basically, with no running water, uh, you know, really brutal conditions. And yet, when he as he describes in his own book, Earned in Blood, um, you know, really quite in his view, it's all he knew, it was quite an idyllic childhood. He was left to roam the, the fields and the hills. And, and of course, what all this gave him, uh, and even if you take the 1930s depression effect out of all of this, which you can't, of course, Woody, but even if you did, it gives him this kind of teak toughness that meant he was an absolutely ideal person uh, for the armed forces. The question was, it was interesting, when he, when he told his dad, I'm, you know, he'd already got into trouble with the law, he'd had a sm small spell in prison because he'd been picked up for, for 
jumping the railroad railways and uh he said to his dad i'm gonna you know i'm gonna join the marines and the dad said you know you, you you'll never survive they'll throw you in the clink and and he said listen it'll either be the making of the breaking either be either make or break me and i think it'll make me and that's exactly what happened because just before he goes so he goes through the whole tough training training regime i don't really have time i'm sure woody to talk about the whole business that marines go through but it's a brutal training regime and you, you know in their boot camps paris paris island in particular which is where ti miller trained um and you really they they begin to dehumanize you uh, you know which again happens in some of the u.s armed forces you you get broken down and then built up again and you either decide to go with it or you fight against it and miller realized there was enough in what he was experiencing and by the way he's only 22 at this stage you know a you know, ridiculously young man and in a very short space of time, he goes from private to sergeant. Uh, we're talking about in the space of about a year, a year and a half. And that tells you he took to the business of soldiering, whether it was, you know, one square meal, well, one definite square meal a day and a, you know, and a reasonable mattress to lay his head. Nobody knows. But what he was able to do is cope with all the toughness, all the, you know, the extreme uh, uh, athletic uh, training that they put you through in boot camp he was able to cope with all of that he could go with you know with with extreme coal with hunger he was absolutely uh, made for the marines and he took to it like a duck to water frankly it gave him for the first time in his life a direction and it gave him a little brother around him he, I, as i already pointed out he came from a big family so it's not like he was missing you know a kind of sense of family but it was like a surrogate family frankly uh, and and very quickly uh, before he goes out to Guadalcanal, uh, he's made up to sergeant and he goes back, you know, just before he's going away to, uh, you know, to say goodbye to his dad before they ship out in, in 42, ultimately, originally to New Zealand and ultimately to Guadalcanal. And, uh, you know, and he, he, it was like he, he goes up to his dad, you know, with his sergeant stripes on. And it was like, I told you so. I'll tell you I'd, I'd make something of myself. And it's also at that point, I should just add, because this is not just about boys with toys. Um, he says to Racy, who you can see here in this picture, who later becomes his wife, he proposes to her, but also very sensibly uh, says, you know, let, let, let's let's just stay engaged. I don't want to make you a widow and we'll get married if I come back. Uh, wow. And so that was the those were the last words. And she's, you know, look, 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 at, look at those two faces. It's just such a wonderful mm -hmm. picture. It is. And, and, and you're right about that tough it's the tough love, though, isn't it? I mean, I know Dale Dye quite well, who was, of course, a Marine and trains up all the actors. And he, and he always tells people it's it is tough. But if you if you are someone like this, who's come from a bit of a difficult childhood in some ways, you, you should be able to recognize that this toughness that's being thrown at you is for your own benefit. And there is this love behind it. And and maybe some of the other branches of military in our country don't offer that that same thing. But Marines, the books I've read and again, Royal Marines would count as well, they do, it does seem to be a home for people who who don't quite fit in, but they find a way of fitting in. The, the Marine Corps or the Royal Marines finds that way of a balance between organization and, and honing these skills, these natural talent, but within a within a disciplined trained environment. It's a it's a unique thing I think the Marine Corps uh, offers, I think. Yeah, and just to briefly mention another couple of people because um, I think the officers are very important and I'll come to them in a minute, but uh, his, well, I'll come to Scoop Adams in a minute, but, but here are another of the two ca key characters, particularly Jim McHenry, who, who's on the uh, right of this picture. Uh, you can see he's quite a tall guy. He is, you know, couldn't be more of a contrast to to T.I. in the sense that he was born in Brooklyn, New York. He was a streetwise uh, uh, Irish ancestry. I mean, a tough New Yorker, basically. Um, but uh, and, and also uh, not not a but, but also someone who'd made a reasonable start to his career is actually earning, you know, above the minimum wage in 1940. And yet, despite all of that, uh, what, what, as soon as Pearl Harbor had come about, he's like, OK, I'm going to join up. The question is, who am, who am I going to end up with now? One of the interesting things about the Marines is not everyone chooses them first off. Quite a few do. I mean, uh, T.I. definitely did. But in the case of McHenry, actually, he's just thinking, you know, I'll, I'll go wherever they take me. And the original office he goes to is closed. And that's why, which I think was the army, which is why he ends up uh, at the Marines. But he immediately, you know, the, the recruiting uh, uh, sergeant is wearing this beauty, the, you know, the beautiful blues that you see in the, in the picture of the, of the U.S. Marines. And he thought they look snappy enough for me. And again, McHenry 
fitted in just nicely. Very different background, very kind of different circumstances. He was, you know, he wasn't wealthy. He came from a tough background himself, but he was already earning reasonable money, as I say, and took a pay drop to join the military well before he was actually drafted. But he immediately took to the, the fellowship that is a military unit, uh, as you pointed out, Woody, not everyone does. And this is one of his great mates, Lou, Lou Gagano. Uh, if, if I honed in on the picture, you would see that Lou is, he looks like a film star. He's a beautifully handsome man. Um, he was he already married before he joined the military with a daughter. And when they're in Australia, jumping forward in the story a little bit after Guadalcanal, they're in Australia kind of letting off steam and Obviously, a lot of them are, you know, are getting Australian girlfriends. Gargano, who's everywhere, you know, all the Australian girls are kind of like all around, you know, like flies to a honeypot because he was so handsome, is, wasn't interested. And eventually, McHenry, because he's such a good mate of Gargano, says, all right, if you're not interested, I'm not interested either, and we'll just drink beer together. So, you know, that, that kind of sense of fellowship, and in the case of Gargano, you know, that loyalty to his wife back home, you know, I think, I think that's really quite unusual. But you get these lovely little nuggets of of human behavior, even when we're not talking about the fighting. I mean, so many books about the Second World War, about combat, you know, I, myself included, um, you know, we all hold our hands up in the end. That's frankly what people want to read about. But I think it's all those other bits and pieces that knit the story together. And what, you, what you're able to do with a book of this type is follow someone's experience from the minute they arrive in the unit to the minute they either, sadly, in the case of Gargano's case, I hope I'm, well, I am giving a, I, I will say no more, but I, I, I'm sure you can imagine what I was about to say. But but from start to finish, you get a kind of wonderful tapestry of who they were and what made them tick. And I think that's what's wonderful about following a small group like this. And so you, you so you do cover the downtime in between the campaigns because that the downtime in the Pacific could be quite lengthy because, again, of the nature of the campaign, the distances involved, you know, if you're fighting in the ETO, for example, you're landing in the beaches of Normandy, it's sort of, almost unrelenting combat at various levels. But the Pacific, there are these gaps. As you said, they are taken off islands, taken elsewhere, Australia, New Zealand, and then they go back in again. And it, that, that, how you adjust to the, it's almost like the bomber crews flying over Europe who have, you know, they're, they're in an intense flak fire one minute, then they're back in the pub the next. But this is the, the same type of thing, but prolonged. You know, you're in these in terrible, awful environments with jungle and disease and insects and Japanese trying to kill you. Then suddenly you're in, in somewhere that's relatively pleasant, like Australia, and you've got to deal with weeks, possibly even months there. So that, that time in between the campaigns must have been very revealing in reading about the guys, about how they're preparing for the next one, because you've see, they've seen stuff they shouldn't really be seeing. They've experienced the worst of warfare. So I'm guessing you feel that that downtime is important to the journey as well. Yeah, and absolutely right. And you and you know, you 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 hit the nail on the head there, Woody, because we're talking about really considerable periods of time. Not not in every case, but certainly between the first two campaigns. So Guadalcanal finishes for the first Marine Division and my unit uh, in December nineteen forty two. And you don't have the next campaign beginning until December 1943. So we've got a year's gap there. And they spend a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it in Australia. Lots of stuff is happening during that period. But it's that decompression that was so crucial for um, uh, the unit and, of course, all of the 1st Marine Division that, that is so interesting to me. And, of course, constantly, Woody, you've got this rejuvenation uh, of the of the company and the 1st Marine Division more generally because they've lost a lot of guys. They lose a lot of guys in every single campaign, some campaigns more than others, actually. Uh, but 3-5 uh, Marines, uh, which was the battalion, and K Company, which is the unit I'm following specifically, uh, tend to be at the sharp end quite a lot, particularly in the last three campaigns, maybe a little bit less in Guadalcanal. And as a result of that, they lose an awful lot of people and they constantly need new blood. So it's how these new guys knit in. It's not just the experience of the vets downtime. It's how they accept and introduce the new guys that I think is so fascinating. And of course, slowly but surely, more of my main characters are, are coming on board. Um, one, one last thing to say about Australia, because it is quite amusing. I mean, that when they leave Guadalcanal, everyone's convinced they're heading back to the US. You know, they think, you know, we've done our bit and surely we're going we're gonna to get a bit of home leave. Well, they're relatively quickly disabused of that by, to by being told they're going to Australia mainly because MacArthur's insisted on them coming down there to help defend Australia. And, of course, he's got plans to use the 1st Marine Division uh, later on for his own ends, which, of course, he does in the next campaign, Cape Gloucester. But uh, 
the first place they get taken to is Brisbane. Now, I've got a great mate who comes from Brisbane. And, you know, Australians today think of Brisbane as, you know, it's tropical. It's, you know, it's a sunny, it's a popular tourist destination. Well, I can tell you that when the first Marine Division got there, particularly K Company, my guys, they hated it. It was, they felt it was almost as bad as Guadalcanal, you know, just covered in mosquitoes, difficult terrain. And so eventually, relatively soon after this, they moved down to southern Australia, well, uh, uh, Victoria to be specific, and that is Melbourne. And that is a different kettle of fish entirely. They love Melbourne uh, and the Victorians love them. And they get this amazing, almost ticker tech welcome when they get there. Welcome literally as the saviors of Australia. Wow. And, and of course, the other thing is while they're phasing in new, new recruits and new officers and new leadership is is doctrine is changing the, the the tactics of how to win the pacific war has changing the the the, the developments even from guadalcanal to okinawa have been profound and you know the the, the use of the, the lvts and the uh, and the naval bombardments improving the air power situation is changing all the time so so that's something that these units UK, UK are having to experience as the as the the way they fought the war in guadalcanal those that are still there is not necessarily the way they fight it in in okinawa okay you've still got to jump out of some kind of amphibious craft and run up beaches. But within that, there's this framework of, of a steady improvement. And that, I guess, is something else you're trying to convey is how the Pacific War is moving on, on a more um, sort of strategic level. Yeah, they, they, you know, in 1942, they're, they're using pretty basic kit, frankly, uh, to be truthful. I mean, they still got the old Springfield rifle. Now, you know, everybody knows that the Americans have one of the best, if not the best, a small arm of the Second World War, which is the M1 semi-automatic, but they didn't have it at Guadalcanal. Now, that uh, some units in the in the U.S. Uh, armed forces did have the M1 in 1942, but the Marines did not, and therefore they fought through that initial campaign with. Um, you know, Springfield was still a good weapon, but it was nowhere near as good as the M1. Um, there, there was lots of kit they didn't have. And the other really striking thing, I'll, I'll come back to the sort of the meat of your question in a second, Woody, but the other really key thing they didn't have on Guadalcanal, at least at the beginning, is any support. I mean, they were effectively marooned on the island for the first yeah. month because of those initial naval defeats uh, that the US Navy suffered. They were left really to fend for themselves. So, and again, that psychological element comes into play. You know, forget about air power. They did get air power after a couple of weeks because they opened up the the airfield that they captured at Henderson Field, as it became known. But they did not have any uh, uh, sense that they were going to be reinforced, that they were going to be properly supplied. I mean, they were living on what they're taking with them, and I include uh, ammunition, of course. And that meant that they were in a very, very uh, precarious situation at least for the first month uh, and the psychological toll that took on everyone was really quite extreme now you move on a couple of campaigns and and the the kit they have and the support they have both aerial and naval it, it, everything changes completely i mean i think 42 the other reason it's the big big game changer is because post the battle of guadalcanal and that i'm talking about the naval battle of guadalcanal yep. which takes place towards the end of the guadalcanal campaign uh, there's no longer any any doubt that the, uh, or at least in that part of the, uh, the the theater, that the U.S. Navy is in charge. But it was in in question, of course, all the way up to that point. And and still, you've got this, you know, this this uh, slowly but surely, the U.S. Navy is getting bigger. And of course, by Okinawa, you know, they've got 20 fleet carriers. Well, there was at one stage during the uh, Guadalcanal campaign where they had a single fleet carrier up against three or four uh, of the Japanese. So the tables are completely turned in terms of support, both naval support uh, and aerial support, because naval support is aerial support in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's run through some more of the, these, these characters that you introduce, and then, then we can, whatever you want to talk about, we'll talk about. But there's some other people I think you want to bring in first, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, I just want to mention a couple of officers. Uh, here's the the officers are, are, are vitally important. We all know this. Uh, uh, and, and that's not to say that the US Marines and K Company in particular didn't have bad officers. It did. Uh, it had some really poor officers. In fact, at, during the Guadalcanal campaign, the company commander, a man called Patterson, hardly left his command post, you know. And I'll, I'll contrast that with a, with a different type of company commander in a minute. But the 
the, the first uh, subunit of the company I follow in Guadalcanal is First Platoon, and it's commanded by this guy, Scoop Adams. He wanted to be a journalist. Um, that was that was the plan. He'd, he'd worked on his university paper. He was from, you know, a relatively traditional uh, New England middle class background. Uh, forget about his background. He was just a natural leader. And, you know, uh, you get from both McHenry and uh, T.I. and various other characters who have left first-hand accounts of that campaign just saying we'd have followed him anywhere. Now, the unfortunate thing about Adams is he, he didn't have a particularly strong constitution and he was laid low by uh, particular, well, various ailments, but particularly malaria during the Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal campaign and that meant that eventually he had to leave the company which is a real tragedy actually because it would have been nice to see him eventually take over the company Patterson was sacked at the end of uh, end of that campaign and he was eventually replaced I say eventually because it took a bit of time I'll, I'll come on to the by this man here um, on the right of that picture is a man called Andy Haldane who's really you know legendary figure partly because of with the old breed usually I'll come on to uh, uh, Gene Sledge in a minute but also of course because of the Pacific you know he, bits of Gene Sledge's book are, are used in the making of the Pacific and Andy Haldane uh, very accurately portrayed in that uh, and very sympathetically too and with good reason because you know I've read a lot of accounts about officers who are considered to be you know the real deal in wartime and I don't think I've ever come across a, a single officer who not a single person had a bad word to say about not only that that it was the opposite he was the finest company commander in the Marine Corps he uh, he had a sensitivity uh, and a toughness this a really extraordinary combination of empathy and uh, but also knowing you know how to be a leader that made him the complete opposite of Patterson and made him a guy everyone was going to follow. And they did follow him for two campaigns. I, w I won't go into the details of what happens to Andy Haldane because, uh, well, some of the listeners will probably know. Uh, and, and Scott Gibson, who played him in the Pacific, is just a wonderful human being. As well. I spent a bit of time with him in June and, and friends with him on Facebook and is continuing this legacy of just being an incredibly brilliant guy and very charismatic Canadian, actually, by birth, but played an American. But... Uh, yeah, an extraordinary. His 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 reputation looms large over a lot of of of, of these campaigns, and and, and then we're gonna there's, there's Sledge, of course, as well. I mean, and that's you know, we go back to that question of the some incredible people you're writing about. I mean, they, these guys were they took professional soldiering to levels and that we can only dream of. I mean, they're just superb at their jobs. Yeah, I mean, we'll come on to some of the assistance I had in a minute. But while we're on the subject of Andy Haldane, I should mention Garrett Shatrowski, who is a former Marine officer himself. I don't know if you've come across him, Woody. Um, great oh, yeah. character. Like a dog with a bone, he's working on the story of Haldane. I hope he'll bring out his biography one day. I mean, he's, he, he's working on it at the moment. And he uh, and th this, this will absolutely sum up the generosity of people that I've encountered involved in this project. Because if I'd been in Garrett's position, first book... Uh, wonderful subject matter. He's got some really extraordinary material, uh, including letters written to him from Haldane and his girlfriend and various family members, never um, uh, uh, been seen before. And yet he was generous enough to let me uh, use some of that material. Not all of it, uh, I think sensibly, because that really would have been foolish. And uh, But really uh, a... a uh, extraordinary act of generosity but also a determination to tell uh, Andy Haldane's story or allow me to tell it as well as I could. Um, I'll just quickly uh, show you another quick picture of him because uh, this is him receiving his silver star. Yeah. I mean what the story that's not that well known actually I should quickly point out Woody um, is is what Haldane does on Cape Gloucester. We know a lot about what he does on Peleliu from with the old breed and and the Pacific. What the Pacific doesn't do is go back to Haldane's story in, uh, and indeed the story of K Company uh, Three Five Marines in Cape Gloucester, and that's where the legend begins. Because I won't go into the detail about this; you'd have to read about it in the book. But one of the great actions of Cape Gloucester, and Cape Gloucester is a much misunderstood uh, and much uh, uh, you know unread, frankly, in yeah, terms of looked. people's yeah. knowledge of it. Campaign. There was some extraordinary uh, fighting going on there, uh, uh, and one particular battle uh, for uh, a ridge that becomes known as Edson's Ridge, uh, Edson of the of the Raiders. Um, but uh, the in the battle for that ridge, 
Andy Haldane wins the Silver Star. Uh, they're attacking this ridge, K Company, almost exclusively. Uh, and they finally get a, get a foothold on the top of the ridge. And before they can actually take the ridge itself, it's nighttime and they dig in just below the, the top of the ridge, the Japanese launch five, five in a row, a kind of, you know, death or glory attacks, uh, you know, these famous almost samurai suicide attacks. And it's in the literally the hand to hand fighting to defend their foxholes along this ridge line that, that Andy Haldane wins his, um, uh, his silver mm. star. It's really quite astonishing uh, fight. Uh, actually, I, I, I got the name wrong. It wasn't Edson. Edson is someone who comes into the story in Peleliu. It was actually Walt, uh, who take, temporarily takes over the 3th Battalion during that fighting. And Walt is up there with K Company in that fight. And Walt, Walt, Walt himself wins the Navy Cross for that particular fight. But it's an extraordinary uh, battle uh, that hasn't, and the story hasn't really been told before. And this is, this is Andy Haldane. Uh, receiving his silver star for that action. And, and leading on from that, stories that haven't been told, I mean, we said we were going to talk a little bit about the, the, the writing and research process because it's been revolution the last few years. I mean, the, 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 and the COVID era sped things up. The, the you know People getting to know each other, the podcasts. Uh, Henry Sledge is watching this show right now. Hi, Henry. And you know Henry, I know Henry. And this ability you have now to just reach people who know one aspect of this war very very deep deeply you know dave holland out in australia knowing about guadalcanal and and henry knowing about his father but also the the the, the, the air force or the marine air force involvement and so how important has that been to you as a writer from your early books 20 20 years ago i guess now to what it's like writing now it's an indif it's a different process isn't it yeah, a completely different process. I mean, the the internet, you, you have to say, have, has been the starting point of all of this. I mean, when I wrote my first book in the 90s, it was a three year project. That that specific project today would not take me longer than a year. And that's not boasting about it. It's just, you know, when you've been writing for 20 years, obviously, you, see, you everything gets speeded up. But it's this it's the access for both people uh, and material. I mean, a lot of, not everything, of course, and I, I would hate to think I would never go to another archive, but just to give you a quick example with this book, Devil Dogs, I mean, during the process of Devil Dog, I'll come on, I'll come back to, you know, some of the people who've helped me in a second, but, but of course, when you go to, or, or when you need to get papers like some of the Haldane papers, which were at his alma mater, Bowden, Bowden in, in New England, um, mm. I wasn't able to travel there during during lockdown, during COVID. So I contacted the archivists and they very generously actually went into the archiv archives themselves. And I don't think that's something that would have happened five or 10 years ago. Was it COVID? Yes, of course, partly. But it was also the fact that everyone's used to dealing uh, online now. They're used to sending documents as attachments. They are, uh, of course, a lot of places, uh, uh, and America's in the lead with this, are digitizing material. The UK's yeah. uh, doing stuff too. But America is just wonderful about the amount of material that's being digitized. I qu must quickly mention, this is a bit off message, but um, when I was uh, doing some research for, for my current project, which is Airborne in the Second World War, um, I was aware, of course, of the amazing archive that Cornelius Ryan left after you know he'd worked on a bridge too far, uh, which is in the States. It's in a university uh, library in the States. And I was thinking, well, I've got to go over there at some point. And I just had a quick look, Woody, online to see what was there. It's all been digitized. I mean, yep. I every know, isn't it? single yep. thing. And of course, that's not just for um, a bridge too far. It's also for the longest day, too. So anyone working on, on D-Day. But, but uh, the final, uh, you know, the, the, the other bit of your question is, you know, how, how do you get in touch with people that you might not have gotten in touch with before? Well, everything's so interconnected now that we're all doing podcasts together. Some, you know, Henry's hosting his own podcast. So it's, it's only natural that this interconnectedness with, with a specific project that you're working on is going to draw your attention to and, and draw you to the attention of other people. And of course, it's so easy to find people now with emails and uh, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of online contact that we can now have. I can speak to Henry uh, either by email or, or, or uh, you know, on a Zoom call. Or It's so simple now, and it, and it gives us all a chance to share material, to, to share contacts, and it's been a revolution, frankly, um, particularly the last five years, uh, and speeded up by COVID, as you've suggested. But it's been a process that's really begun with the whole uh, internet revolution.
And, and I think it's it's become common now to share stuff. I mean, I, there, when I was starting to contact historian 25 years ago, some, most would share stuff, some wouldn't. You'd, you'd, but now I think it's just become expected and accepted that share with other people because then they'll share with you when they have the thing you want. And it's become much more of a... It isn't our history, is it? it? None of none of the we didn't do any of these things ourselves. We're only communicating about them either via YouTube or the written word. It's not our history, but the, of course, people have their the information they've they've acquired and and filed and organized, and that needs crediting. But the sharing it is is the important thing, and sharing it by different media as well. And the, the podcast and YouTube channel revolution, and it's been been amazing as well. So um. Yeah, you wanted to give some shout outs to people who've helped you and then yeah just wherever you want to talk about let's talk about it. i'm enjoying thoroughly enjoying this yeah well uh, you know I, uh, we, we've spoken about henry i mean henry henry was brought to my attention um by richard frank who's another person i've, I've been in contact with since i was working Legend, yep. on this project evil dot not not uh my previous one crucible of hell uh you know I, first of all i contacted richard I mean, think of this. Think how generous this is. You, you, I, I know you. You can imagine how busy Rich is. Not least because he's trying to finish the second volume of what is going to be, you know, the, the most extraordinary history of the Pacific War. Um, and yet, despite all the calls on his time, despite the fact that he was, you know, probably a little bit behind with his project, he still took time out to read the whole manuscript and comment on it. Not just, you know, with a couple of paragraphs, but in extreme detail all the way through. So that, you know, of course, the specific stuff, you know, what the individual soldiers were doing, the characterization of the soldiers, he sort of let me get on with that, assuming that I was, you know, I, I was taking good care, which I hope I was. It was the bigger picture he was, he, he is, of course, such an expert in and, and wanted to, you know, help me along the way. And, and it's, I think, you know, this book is about individual soldiers, but it's also about the big picture too. I mean, I think if you can pull off both tricks, both give a sense of the grand drama of the Pacific, why these why these guys actually ended up with places like Cape Gloucester and Peleliu, uh, as well as the you know the bird's eye view of what's happening in the foxholes. You, you've got it all really, and I've got Henry. I, I'm sorry, I've got Rich F Frank to thank hugely for that. And then, of course, having been in contact with him, he knows Henry very well. They're, they're good friends. He then said to me, "Well, I'm sure Henry would be interested in reading it." And I'm thinking, "Well, I can tell you, I'd be delighted if Henry read it." And 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 that started a, a contact with Henry that I hope will you know will continue for years to come. He again very generously read the manuscript and provided the foreword to the book. And you know how important the sledge name is to the story. And so to have Henry endorsing the book is you know you 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 couldn't you know you you, you couldn't hope for a better uh, start for the project. And he's also very generously said that one of the things I wanted to do as much as I could with with his dad is to flesh out a little bit some of the stuff that's not in with the original with the old breed. Now, what Henry's doing, interesting enough, as I, I don't know if he's discussed with you before, Woody, is he's putting together a book of, of, uh, of his dad's experiences, including some of the stuff with the old breed that wasn't in the original manuscript. I mean, the original uh, publishers, Presidio, were quite tough with how much he had to cut. And, and inevitably, there's a lot of wonderful material that was never used. So he's going to use that for a, a follow-up book, which I think will be absolutely gripping. But what I was able to do by being given access to Auburn University archives, where all the sledge uh, archive is, that is his dad's uh, archive, is get a lot of the letters that were written after the Second World War and a lot that he wrote to his family during the Second World War and add that and interweave that into the story. And it fleshes out not only uh, Gene Sledge himself, Sledgehammer, of course, as he's known to, uh, you know, legions of people who've read his book, but also the people he fought with uh, a little bit more, shall we say, than, than you would necessarily have had from just with the old breed. And the legacy as well. I mean, that's when I, I mean we're going down into a Henry Sledge Appreciation Society meeting. But the fact that Henry has understood the legacy and how important his father's book was to all of us growing up. It was, one, as we said, one of those seminal books that I think I read when I was 12 or something the first time. And it was just what is this it was it was like a commando comic but real that was it was it, it had the visceral nature of reading like, like a, the books i was reading as a kid but it was real and it was important but um yeah and henry uh, um he'll be on my show next week with i'm um, talking about the um the squadrons flying over Palulu. so i'll be looking forward to speaking spending time with him again so um and he's saying it's an honor to uh, count you as a friend he's saying there on the sidebar so there you are i, I agree with honor to count you both as friends so um 
Down with the book again. So, you, you, you know, you're following this one unit all the way through. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap things up in a few minutes or so. But what, what are your aims for it? You, I think you said it already. It's to tell the stories of the people, but also explain why the hell they were there in the first place. I mean, what I'd hope, it, I, I, I hope it's, a, it, it, they always say in publishing, you know, don't try and do too many things with, with a single project. You know, it's a great question, Woody, because what is this book for? What I what I hope it'll be is an immersive experience for anyone who wants to get a sense of what life must have been like to fight their way th through the Pacific. They will be alternately appalled, delighted, horrified, uh, uh, you know, admiring. I mean, all those human emotions will, will come out when you read the story of these extraordinary young men. You know, and I, I will stress, not all of them do the right thing all the time. Uh, but they were chronicles uh, at the time. And of course, ultimately, I hope my book does something similar by a very sensitive young man, that's Gene Sledge, who was able to tell the story with an unflinching honesty. And, and so I'm piggybacking piggybacking on that really but it's the sort of thing I try to do with all my books so in mm. the end I hope you'll get a sense of what they went through what they sacrificed frankly not just them but the families too there's a there's an after uh, word chapter or an aftermath chapter that gives a sense of what happened to all these guys afterwards and all my key players um, uh, uh, T.I. Uh, Sledgehammer all the key uh, Jim McHenry and many others, you get a, you, you you follow them through the rest of their lives, and a lot of them have you know they 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 they, they uh, have good lives. You know they 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 make the best of the fifties and sixties, but what they cannot escape is the experience of of what they've gone through. A lot of them are suffering quite clearly, including Sledgehammer from you know uh, an equivalent of PTSD, um, and, and it takes a long time for them to work their way through that. And one of the ways they're able to do that is by coming back together as a brotherhood. And so I think the final bit of the book and the, the, the bit that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm most proud of is that the way it ties it all together at the end is Sledgehammer's writing of the book and then meeting and joining the, the, the various associations, the first Marine Division Association, meeting all the K Company guys again and seeing how proud they are of his ability to tell their story. It was their, uh, it was their, thumbs up that he was looking for, not the ordinary guy in the street, although, of course, he was delighted that it, it became a huge bestseller. So that's the intention of the book, an immersive experience. Can you can you see the the fighting through the eyes of these young men? And can you go through all the emotions they went through? And, and, and thanks. That was a wonderful answer. But, you know, it, you've, you've written about you've, you're currently writing about the British Airborne. You've done the special boat squadron. You've done, you know, the, uh, the Operation Thunderbolt Israeli um, teams. But post wars after these amazing experiences the experiences of veterans were weren't the same and i don't mean individual i mean as units there was something about the pacific campaign that united and bonded people in a different way than perhaps sbs veterans and is that something you've been aware of when you've dealt with these different groups of veterans is that they they there are these collective different ways of viewing of the wars depending on which kind of aspect they fought through it. I mean, the SBS, the sort of insurgent, then go back again. And this, the Pacific is this, this we, we talk about the, the breaks they get in Australia, but it is when you're in theatre, unrelenting misery. There's not much of a sense of heroism or, 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 or secret missions that you're accomplishing something major with one, one swoop, like the SBS did, for example. So it, when you deal with these veterans, they are all having very different experiences post-war, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely agreed. And and airborne, of course, come into the you know the SBS category. Really, they're going on these missions, but they're you know, and in some cases, they you know, in North Africa, they're fighting long and hard in 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 you know as infantry. But generally speaking, there's a lot of downtime for these guys. Um, and the difference, as you quite rightly point out, Woody, in the Pacific, is that these campaigns are three, four months of. of unbelievably grueling experience you've got the weather against you've got you've got a pitiless enemy I and mean, we haven't really talked much about the japanese mm. but you know i think it goes without saying they did not give in on most of these islands um if they were wounded and you were trying to take them prisoner it was there was a good chance you were going to be wounded or killed yourself by uh, these guys who you know who of course had been told that it was it was shameful to to become a prisoner of war and that brutalized everyone. So I think to, to answer your question about the, 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 the vets, the closeness of the, of the vets is directly related to the 
uh, the length of the ordeals they go through, these three, four months experience, which is off the charts, frankly, with anything I've written about in, in the uh, European theatre of operations. And I can only compare it, as I think I said before, when we were discussing Crucible of Hell, to some of the stuff that you read about on the on the Eastern Front in, in, uh, yeah, yeah, in Russia and Germany. I mean, that is the only comparison I can make because um, it was unrelenting horror and if you got through it, of course, it did create this incredibly strong bond. Uh, and in the case of, of uh, Gene Sledge, you had a, you know, I, I keep coming back to this because it is a remarkable thing that he was able to do, which is to uh, somehow put into words the, the experience of, of what they'd gone through. Uh, and that was tremendously important for all of those guys. Yes, they could talk about it uh, themselves, but it was having it out there among the broader American public um, I think was a really important moment. And it wasn't just yeah. for the vets of, of K Company. It, it was for the whole... You said that the whole public had an idea of what they went through. But you, it's got a bit of an, a, a tangent question, but it, it's coming off of something you said earlier. Because I know when, you, when we talked about Crucible of Hell, how you were saying about the importance of trying to put some of the Japanese accounts in here. So that so so have you were you able to find Japanese sources for these campaigns, Peleliu, Guadalcanal, Okinawa, for, for this book? Yeah, and I, I've done that. I've done that again. Uh, maybe, maybe not as comprehensively as I was able to do with Okinawa. Although, of course, I've I've uh, cherry picked a few of the best things that I didn't use <laughs> for Okinawa. In fact, I got a, a quick confession to make. While I was writing Crucible of Hell, I already had it in the back of my mind. I might, I might do, I might write Devil Dogs, and I kept back a, a, quite a, a bit of the material relating to K35 on Okinawa, which of course is gold dust. Uh, uh, but yes, to be specifically answer your question, as much as I've been able to, I've included uh, first-hand accounts from the Japanese side all the way through. They aren't anything like as comprehensive, of course, of, of, but you do get a pretty good flavor of, of what people are thinking. And there's a lot of discussion about what, what the Japanese high command are up to and, and how they're trying to plan their Pacific campaign as well. Brilliant. Well... We will bring things to an end, but just remind people that it's not it's available pre-order now, but when will it be on the shelves? Uh, well, it's going to be on the shelves uh, quite neatly, I think, uh, both in the US and the UK on the 15th of September of right. this year. So about six weeks time. And are you going to be doing any kind of promotional tours in the USA? Obviously, you'll be doing the usual kind of war festy type things next year and podcasts with James and Al. But any plans to take it to, to go over to the USA and launch it there? I, I hope uh, yet to be confirmed. I mean, uh, as Henry knows, we're in discussions with with various places. It, it's partly going to be a financial issue. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a very good press, but not a not a very wealthy press, shall we say, in the in the United States, uh, Pegasus Press. Uh, and they've said they'd be, you know, delighted if I can come out and do as much as I can. Of course, the get, but, you know, we, we need to find some funding for it. So either pay, I pay for it myself or or hopefully some of the places where I might go and talk will will help out with travel. But I, I'm definitely up for it in terms of uh, being able to commit the time to do that, Woody. So we'll have to wait and see. Of course, the downside, uh, if you can call it that, of, of the uh, revolution and using Zoom and everything else is you can do interviews now uh, across the yeah. pond. But it would be a shame if, if I wasn't actually be able to get out there and sign some copies uh, for sure. Yeah, well, that'd be good, that'd be good for, the, for the audience as well. And it comes back, yeah, that, that Brit going over there and telling Americans about the, their <laughs> legends, is you know, that, that'll be a bit of a um, you know, squeaky bum time, as they say, as you walk out on a stage in front of loads of Marine vets and tell them their history. But yeah, if, if anyone can do it, you can do it, Sol, because you've you've got the track record. And when I spoke to um, Henry about it the last time, he said he was so glad that you picked up this idea and he was so glad it's you taking it forward because, you know, he, he'd read Crucible of Hell. I mean, you, you know this story yourself. So it's it's, it's important that, 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 that it's recognized that you, you have the backing of some very important people with this project and it's not just something you're just dashing into. It's coming with that respect and that for, for what these guys went through because that's the ultimate thing as you're, you're, you're going to convey is it was an experience that none of us can ever possibly imagine even henry who you know, obviously spent time with his father there's always going to be that distance of never really fully understanding the, what those guys went through and if you can only go if you can get half the way to explaining to people what it was like to be there you've done a fantastic job i think yeah th th thanks woody i just end uh last quick comment on 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 henry because he he told me a great anecdote, which is in the book, which is uh, this is in the aftermath bit of the book where his dad is uh, 
asked to go back to Peleliu with a tour. And um, the, tour, oh, yeah. the tour, tour says, look, you know, we'll fully fund it. We'll pay for you. You know, just like, please just come along with the tour and it'd be wonderful to have you there. And of course, you can imagine the clients would have been delighted. And, uh, and <laughs> he said, Eugene said, um, I, you know, I've been there once. I don't need to go back. And the first time was fully paid for too <laughs> by the US yep. government. Um, you know, and it was the one place he insisted. Uh, we haven't talked much about Peleliu, but uh, again, you'll have to read the book and anyone who's read with the old breed will know what I'm talking about. It was, you know, a, 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 of the four campaigns, it was the most pitiless of the four. Uh, and mm. it was the one place that, that Gene Sledge, Eugene Sledge said he never wanted to go back to and he never did. No, understandable. I mean, it, 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 just just harrowing and awful. And um, but anyway, perhaps you'll come back on in September when the comes book comes out and do a little deep dive on Pelelu. Perhaps we could bring Henry and to have to have the have the two of you talk about that. That'd be interesting. But um, we'll leave it at that, folks. So you're writing about the um, British Airborne right now, and then beyond that, you just m more books. I'm guessing. Yeah, more books, but nothing, nothing in the pipeline. I mean, we, we, I've normally got one on the one, one in the bookshelves, one in the, one on the stocks, and and one I'm actually working on now. I've moved one step beyond that. Now I've got I've got Devil Dogs in the bookshops, soon to be working on Airborne, and I really don't know what I'm going to do next. So, uh, any anyone got any suggestions? I'd be very interested to hear. Well, I, I, could... I, I want a book on the Balkans. That's what I've, I, I, that's that's what I now think is the, the untapped, underexplored, but incredibly complicated theater of operations. And the more I read, the more I realize I just, goodies and baddies are just terms that are so, so <laughs> confusing in that theater. But that Balkans, if you, you'd get my support for a Balkans book, but we'll see. That, that's one sale. That, thanks, Woody. But anyway, brilliant. We'll leave things in. So um, I'll just take you off screen for a second. As I tell you, we'll go tomorrow. So tomorrow, really important folks, uh, show folks. Jeffrey Roker's coming on to talk about the incredible Missing Marines project. So we're back to Guadalcanal again. His book, Leaving Mac Behind, is about this work he and his association have been doing to, to track down the, 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 ten, the tens of thousands of, of personnel there are missing from World War II, but particularly these Marines on his own. So Jeffrey has done some incredible work. He's got an amazing website. So it's allowing him to give um, you or the viewer an idea of what work is still being done to track down missing Marines and bring closure. That would be a very important show. And then John McManus on Friday. What, what What's not to like, to quote James and Al there. But I'll bring Sol back on to say goodbye. So so um, thank you very much, Sol. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And um, it's been a good chat. So um, there we are. This is Paul Woodhead and Sol David of World War II TV. So I will see you all again tomorrow. And Sol will see us again uh, on some future visit. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.